Hi guys, um, just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be actually doing the this week's lecture in two videos. Uh, the first one I'll do is this one, the healthy newborn, and then once we're done with this one, I will record the gestational age or the physical assessment PowerPoint. Uh, there's a lot of information in both PowerPoints, uh, both what's on the PowerPoint and what I'm going to discuss. There are some things I will give you details, um, but just for your own information. Um, so, all right, well, let's get started. And I can never get the first slide to move. I don't know why. There we are. All right, so our first slide is the APGAR scoring. This is always done at one minute and five minutes whether the baby's born vaginally or whether the baby's born by C-section. When you're doing postpartum care, you will always know what their APGAR scores are. If their APGAR scores are poor, they will do them again at 10 minutes. The, the scores range um, at, for a total from 0 to 10. Anything 7 uh, to 10 is a good rating. Anything below 7 either requires an intervention or a resuscitation. So we'll kind of go over this. Uh, for an appearance, the nurse or you guys, once you get into OB, will take a peek at the baby. If the baby's pink all over their arms, their legs, their body, their head, uh, they'll score a two. If their belly and their torso is pink, but their arms and their legs are blue, they'll score a one. But if that baby's blue or pale all over their, their um, arms, their legs, their head, their belly, their chest, they'll score zero. For a pulse, if there's no pulse at all, if they come out uh, with no pulse, they'll score zero. Anything under 100 is a one, and anything over over 100 is a two. If baby's crying and pulling away when stimulated, uh, they'll score a two. And what I mean by stimulated is once baby's born and uh, before we put her put the baby on mom's chest. We will dry the baby off and warm them off. So uh, you'll see the nurse kind of rubbing the baby, drying them off. Um, but that's that's to help get them to cry so that they they can score higher on the APGAR, make sure they're responsive. If that cry or that grimace uh, is weak when we're when we're drying them off, they'll score a one. But if they have no response at all to their drying or um, they're moving around, they'll score a zero. Activity. So when their arms are flexed or their legs are flexed and we pull them to try and straighten them and they resist it, they'll score a two. If there's some flexion in their arms but they're not really resisting when we straighten their arms, they'll score a one. But if they're just kind of limp and they don't resist and they don't have their arms flexed at all, they'll score a zero. For respirations, if they have a really good strong cry when we're drying them off, when we're stimulating them, they'll score a two. If, that re if those respirations are weak or irregular or they're gasping for air or need resuscitation, they'll score a one. If they have no respirations at all, they'll score a zero. Umbilical cord. The new evidence-based practice is now to delay clamping that cord. So once baby's born, instead of clamping that cord right away, they're actually allowing the blood from the placenta to flow into the baby so that any extra iron or um, anything, oxygen, that would be lost by clamping that umbilical cord uh, is actually transfused into the baby. And they've said that it's healthier for the baby and does a lot more for them. So anytime a baby's born, that umbilical cord is checked for two arteries and one vein. And the clamp, we actually used what's called a Hollister clamp, um, and it's done about a half to one inch from the baby's belly. That umbilical cord, as many of if you've see, had kids or um, seen brand new babies, that umbilical cord actually turns black and dries up <clears throat> and then will eventually fall off uh, within two weeks. That is one thing that we always need to educate our parents on, especially first-time parents because that can be pretty scary to someone who's not expecting it, because basically when they go in to change the diaper, 
they may actually find it in the diaper or they might bump it while they're trying to wipe baby up or whatever and it might actually fall off. It does not hurt the baby. Um, it's basically it's basically dead, uh, kind of like you know a fingernail. Um, but we just need to make sure we're educating our parents about that. So this slide, um, there's a lot of material on it, um, but I want what I want you to get out of it is the baby when they come through the birth canal, they're squished. Uh, babies who are born C-section do not get this squish and the fluid doesn't come out as much. Um, but as their chest is compressed, they're, um, they've got increased intrathoracic pressure. The fluid is squeezed out of the lungs, but as that chest recoils, um, they've got the negative intrathoracic pressure, which stimulates them to breathe. We'll get into the rest of these um, when we're talking about the the, the next few slides. <coughs> the foramen ovale, um, actually, there's between the atrium is a little shunt, as you can see on here. In utero, the blood flows from the right atrium to the left atrium. And once the baby's born, the pressure becomes greater in the left atrium now, which actually causes that little flap to close. Um, generally, or it doesn't function anymore uh, at once, oh, maybe two hours after birth, um, but actually physically closes within about two years. The ductus arteriosus, if you remember, this is the ones that uh, bypass the lungs. Um, it's a blood vessel that can, connects the main pulmonary artery uh, to the aorta. Uh, when a baby's in utero, the, their blood doesn't need to be oxygenated because mom's doing that for a baby. Uh, so they are able to basically bypass the lungs, uh, get oxygen to the rest of the body um, because the babies aren't breathing in and they're not getting oxygen into their, into their lungs. Um, if this does not close at birth, uh, it runs into a big problem if the baby's blood is not going to be oxygenated because once they're born, mom's not oxygenating their blood for them. Um, so just remember that this is the one that bypasses the lungs. Once it closes, baby's able to oxygenate their own blood. Um, this is one closes uh, within uh, 18 to 24 hours and is functionally or is physically closed within two to three weeks. So you can kind of see this ligament, ligamentum arteriosum is where that shunt was before they were born. Once they're born and it closes, it actually becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. The ductus venosus, uh, this is actually the shunt that bypasses the liver. Um, the changes that occur that cause this ductus venosus to close is when the umbilical cord is cut, uh, when the blood is starting to redistribute uh, because of the ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale. Once that blood is redistributed during all this, causes um, the ductus venosus to close and also the cardiac output of the baby. Um, so the pathway that the blood takes um, is from the umbilical from the placenta to the umbilical vein to the left portal vein to the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. Um, but once this closed the blood is actually shunted straight in um, into the liver and forces the blood to the liver. Um, yeah. Generally, it closes within two months and becomes the ligamentum venosum. So you can kind of see where it is in the picture here. Here's just another um, map kind of 
explains a little another way. And this is uh, my favorite video. It really explains it well, um, all about the the different uh, circulation, how it changes from the fetus to the baby. So when you guys, I mean, I would really, really recommend watching this video. She has a really good way of explaining it that makes sense. Uh, so respiratory adaptations, um, it's kind of a type of, it's, it's more, it's a lot simpler than you would expect. When baby's born, they come out, they're cold, it's bright, and it's noisy. This kind of causes them to take a deep breath in. Uh, they're kind of, during delivery, they're going from getting all of their oxygen from the placenta and mom, uh, but once they're going through the birth canal and they get squeezed, it kind of almost does a type of asphyxia, and then once they're out of the birth canal, it causes them to take their big deep breath. Surfactant is actually a lipoprotein that is basically a coating on the inner part of the lungs. It keeps the lungs stable and makes them kind of a slippery so that they can, when they breathe in, their lungs expand. When they breathe out, their lungs kind of... If you see uh, on this picture here on the left where it's inflated, you can see how the lungs are open and able to breathe in and out. Uh, but on the right it's kind of like a wrinkled prune that they can't, it's sticky and it's hard. They can't, when they take a deep breath, that the cells don't slide past each other to expand. Generally, the surfactant is produced in utero between 28 and 32 weeks. Any preemie baby that is born before that is generally given surfactant through the vent as well as caffeine to kind of help with their drive for breathing. So their blood system, <coughs> blood system, I don't think that's quite a word, but generally their hemoglobin is about 17 at birth. Their blood is very concentrated um, because they are, they're not taking in, we'll get into that in the next slide, um, but it's, the volume isn't there. Uh, the hemoglobin and the hematocrit might actually fall within the first couple months. Um, because the red cell mass is decreased. The red blood cells for an adult is generally 100 to 120 days. Baby our red blood cell lifespan is actually only 60 to 70 days. So if you think the, baby, the baby's red blood cells only live about two months, where the adults live about three, there's a lot more um, switching around going on. When the hemoglobin is low, um, the erythropoietin levels rise, and cause the urethropoiesis to return. Once the urethropoiesis resumes, baby's able to use the stores of iron that they've worked up while they were in utero um, to make new red blood cells. Generally, hematocrit for a baby is about 48 to 69 percent. Um, anything over 65 percent might actually indicate polycythemia, which is kind of occurs due to the decreased oxygen level which is maybe a low hemoglobin. So it all is interlinked. So this is what I was talking about. The hemoglobin and hematocrit levels um, are actually increased. Um, but it's, like I said, it's, it's more of a uh, concentrated. Uh, there's less volume. And babies are not taking in much when they're first born, especially if they are breastfed. Mom's not producing very much milk, they're just producing the colostrum. We'll get into that in, I think, next week. Um, but they only produce a small amount of the colostrum until the mature milk comes in. So they're really not getting a whole lot. Uh, so it's basically the same idea of uh, them being dehydrated. Newborns are, don't clot, clot as well. Um, their platelets don't function as well. Um, so that's why we give them vitamin K uh, the day they're born, pretty much right after delivery. Uh, baby isn't able to make vitamin K, 
because they have the, the normal intestinal flora that they need to make vitamin K, um, they're not able to make that until they're about nine months of age. So once they're born, they're not getting their clotting factors from mom. Uh, so the clotting factors that we're talking about is the two, the seven, the nine, and the 10. These four clotting factors actually require the vitamin K. Um, so when we give them vitamin K, their body's actually able to use that to um, make clotting or to be able to coagulate their blood in case something would happen. Temperature regulation. <coughs> in a neutral thermal environment, in NTE, um, baby's oxygen consumption and metabolism are lower rates and this keeps their temperature stable. The environment, um, is, it a, is it a good temperature, an ambient temperature? Um, and the baby's using calories to keep their body heat uh, between 36.4 and 37.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, when a baby is um, cold and they aren't able to keep their temperature up, um, they actually consume more oxygen and their metabolism actually increases. Um, I know I had a student on um, clinical who was in and saw a C-section and they weren't able to give their baby a bath just because they wanted to make sure that the baby was able to st keep their temperature stable. I know a lot of places do have a policy where they don't give the bath until at least eight hours. Um, some have where they have to have a regular temp for at least four for assessments. Uh, it just kind of depends on what the policy is for the facility, but basically they're not able to um, regulate their body temperature right away. Um, the problem with newborns and being able to regulate their temperature is they don't have or they don't have as much fat supplies, um, especially if they are a small preterm baby. Um, their blood vessels are closer to the skin in newborns. Um, there's decreased surface area. Uh, we'll get into more of this in detail in a minute. Um, but preterm babies also have a lot more fluid, um, and their skin is very, very thin. Uh, so they actually lose heat by evaporation. Um, so kind of going into this a little bit more in detail. Um, all newborns are at risk. Uh, that's why you're always we're always dressing babies and you know sleepers and bundling them up and swaddling them, um, especially babies that have limited sub-Q sub fat and their skin is very thin. Um, like I said before, their blood vessels are a lot closer to the surface of the skin, um, so they lose a lot of heat that way. Their body is generally in a flexed position, which gives them a decreased surface area. Um, they have a large amount of heat loss from their head, so always teach mom and dad to have a hat on them. The size and the age of the newborn really um, correlate with how, how they're able to regulate their body temperature. If they're premature, if they're um, small for gestational age, they're at a higher risk uh, for becoming cold than a normal size baby, which is, you know, seven and a half pounds or so. We get into that in the physical assessment. So <clears throat> for all babies, the goal is to maintain their body temperature. And then we'll get into the four different, or four, yeah, four different um, ways that they lose heat. Um, so convection is basically the baby's losing heat um, because of cooler, which is cooler than body temperature, air currents. Um, if you have a baby in an air-conditioned room and you don't have them swaddled or covered up, they'll lose it, lose heat by convection. Uh, if you, if they are in the incubator and in the warmer, and you take them out to do cares, they'll lose heat by convection. An oxygen mask can actually blow on them and it gets cold they'll lose heat by convection. So if you just think it's a baby sleeping on a bed with the air conditioner blowing on them, that cold air will actually take away their heat. Radiation. Um, this is 
any time that the baby's losing their heat to an object that is not, and I repeat, not in direct contact with them. Um, if there is a cup of ice sitting in the room, their heat might actually go to that, or the walls of the room, or if the incubator isn't warm, um, their heat might actually be transferred to that, and that's called radiation. <clears throat> Evaporation. Uh, this is any time that their heat is actually lost um, because of the water or the wetness on the baby's skin is changing into a, a vapor or a gas. So the example of this would be during the bath, like the 24-hour, or yeah, well, depending on the facility's policy, um, but during their first bath or right when they're born where they're wet with the amniotic fluid. Uh, that's why once the baby's born, they're taken straight over to the warmer where they're stimulated and they're dried and they're warmed up. Conduction. <clears throat> this is basically any time they're losing heat by an object that is in direct contact with their skin. Um, it can Nurses always have cold hands, uh, so it can actually be transferred to cold hands you know, from the baby's warm body to the nurse's cold hands. Um, any type, any time we use things for their cares, um, whether we put them on a cold scale, generally try and warm them up and put a, a barrier down. But uh, if the scale is cold or if we're using a cold stethoscope, um, they may actually lose, lose heat that way. Um, in NICU, they actually have, keep their steth the bell of their stethoscope inside the incubator uh, just to keep it warm so that there isn't a, a risk because generally those babies are so tiny that it doesn't take much for them to um, to become cool and start having some uh, cold stress. Thermogenesis. Um, anytime that the skin receptors on the baby experience a drop in their um, a drop in the environmental temperature. Um, in this picture here is where the brown kind of coloring is on the babies, on their, on their sternum, on their clavicles, um, on the little lower back, um, and on their spine on the back. Um, this is called brown adipose tissue, and this is what the babies use to generate heat. Uh, once the baby is about 25 weeks uh, gestation, um, up until they're 3 to 5 weeks, this is what they use when they become cold. Um, or the fat is um, produced from 25 weeks up until they're three to five weeks old. Um, but once they're born, this is what is used to keep them warm. They use the stores. Um, if you notice a newborn um, shivering, um, it's really doing very little. So when we get cold as adults, we start to shiver and are shaking and our goosebumps. That all warms us up. But a newborn, that doesn't do anything because their meta metabolic rate has actually doubled and using the calories and using the fat stores is what they're doing to keep warm. Once they start shivering, it's really not doing anything. Um, as you can see here, that does, the shivering doesn't occur until they're about a year old. Um, but up until then, they use the brown fat, they use the calories, they use the glucose uh, to keep themselves warm. So getting into cold stress. Newborns that have cold stress where their temperature is dropping and it's causing stress to the baby, their oxygen needs are going to increase. They're going to be consuming a lot more oxygen. Uh, their calorie consumption is going to increase. Uh, their meta Ugh, I can't talk tonight, sorry. Their metabolism is going to increase. Um, all of these things are going to be done to produce heat. Um, they might produce more fatty acids. Um, and once, uh, the, once they start using up all their stuff, they're going to start using their sugar stores, uh, which a baby really doesn't have a whole lot of sugar stores to waste. Generally, when a baby's born a couple hours after birth, their blood sugar is generally about 45. Uh, so, 
And then when they're experiencing cold stress, they're unable to conjugate their bilirubin. We'll get into bilirubin in a little bit. Um, but when they cannot conjugate their bilirubin, they can't get rid of it. Uh, so this the bilirubin actually will build up when they're experiencing cold stress, and it may deposit in the brain, which is called connectoris, and it can actually cause permanent neuro neurological damage. So it can be very, very serious when these babies get cold. So some of the things that we will notice when babies are experiencing cold stress, their extremities are going to be cool, their arms, their legs, they're going to be lethargic. They may have periods of apnea, but they also may have periods of tachypnea. So they'll be breathing really, really fast, and then they'll stop breathing. And then they'll breathe really, really fast because they're trying to breathe as fast as they can to get that warmth. Um, they're not going to feed very well, which is not good either because their blood sugars will actually drop because of cold stress. Um, and you're going to see, because they're trying to breathe faster and get the get warmer, you're going to see them go into respiratory distress. They're going to have the nasal flaring. They're going to have the grunting. They're going to have the retractions, like the chest retractions in between their ribs. You're really going to notice um, these poor babies struggling. The cool extremities, they may be um, beginning to turn blue, which is called acrocyanosis. This is just basically a poor, poor circulation, poor perfusion to the outer extrem or the outer ex well, the extremities. Um, babies are very good at keeping the important stuff. If they're having problems with their circulation, uh, what circulation they do have is going to go to the important parts, the the trunk and every, all the body organs and perfuse to the arms and the legs at last. So here's just another um, kind of descriptor for cold stress. Baby gets cold, O2, um, their consumption is going to increase, which is going to increase their respiratory rate, which causes vasoconstriction of their, the pulmonary vasoconstriction, which causes um, a lower level of oxygen intake by the lungs. Um, it's also going to cause peripheral vasoconstriction, which is causing the acrocyanosis, um, which is then going to produce a decrease in oxygen to all of the tissues, uh, which is then going to lead to the baby using up all of their sugar stores, and it's going to drop the PO2 and the pH, which may lead them into metabolic acidosis. Um, I hope this picture kind of works um, and reminds you um, kind of the process of the cold stress. Um, liver adaptations, uh, iron storage and red blood cell. When baby's born, there are some, the red blood cells can be destroyed um, and iron um, is then stored in the liver when it's needed to make more red blood cells. If mom has had enough iron intake, that's why we encourage mom to take a prenatal vitamin and sometimes um, iron supplement. The, the baby can actually store enough iron until they're five months old so they can start using what they've stored up. Glucose homeostasis. Um, babies start uh, storing sugar uh, once when they're in when they're fetus um, and during the third trimester is when they actually start uh, storing the most at peaks. Once a baby's born their blood sugar actually drops reaching the nadir at uh, one to two hours. Uh, when the brain actually used the lactate is actually stored in the brain uh, so during the times that the blood the blood sugar is low. Um, and can actually, this is why the lactate will increase if they have, if their blood sugar is kept at a low level for too long. Um, once, you know, it may drop at one to two hours, um, but they actually use their glucose stores and will decrease their insulin production. Uh, so at three to four hours, that blood glucose will actually raise up. Uh, we want it, like I said, 
uh, baby's normal blood, blood glucose is 45, so that kind of gives you an idea. I know at 45, my blood sugar, I don't feel good at all, but it, that's the normal average for a newborn. All right, so in the liver, bilirubin needs to be conjugated. So indirect, indirect bilirubin, which is basically a yellow, a lipid, it's soluble. Um, my computer is dying. Hold on. Okay, so conjugation, indirect bilirubin, it's yellow, it's lipid, it's a solu lipid soluble pigment. Um, it's actually changing it into the direct, the water soluble pigment uh, that these babies can excrete. Um, bilirubin, when it's not conjugated, the unconjugated bilirubin, it actually will be stored in fatty tissues and can be built up. And if it's if it's not if it's not conjugated, the baby is not able to excrete it. If that makes sense. So conjugated bilirubin, it's water soluble, and they can uh, excrete it in the urine in the stool, mostly the stool. Unconjugated bilirubin gets stored in the fatty tissues and will build up because they're unable to excrete it. So a total bilirubin is the amount of indirect, the unconjugated, and the direct, the conjugated bilirubin. <coughs> so, um, when a baby's born, uh, bilirubin might actually be elevated because now, um, once they're born, it's the responsibility of the baby to conjugate their own bilirubin. Um, up until their birth, they are, you know, mom is conjugating all of the bilirubin and excreting the bilirubin. Um, but now after they're born, it's their responsibility to do their own conjugating. Um, total bili at birth should be less than three. Yeah. Um, so basically in utero, um, the unconjugated bilirubin can actually cross a placenta and mom will get rid of it, or mom will change it into conjugated bilirubin and baby can excrete it. Um, but more often than not, I mean, mom is going to get rid of any bili that the baby needs to. Newborns have an in increased risk for jaundice, which is call also called icterus. Um, because they have the, I can't, I'm not even going to try and say that, I, the glu glucuronyl transferase activity. Um, and a, they only have about 1% of what an adult has. Uh, they have a large bilirubin load. Um, and they're not, their liver isn't fully functionable. Um, so they have this decreased ability to actually conjugate their own bilirubin. So it may build up in their fatty tissues. So, physiological jaundice is a non-pathologic, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Um, basically, it is not related to a disease at all. They might, you might start seeing symptoms of this um, if the levels get about 6 to 7, uh, and generally it occurs about 24 hours after birth. It starts in the head and then down um, the trunk. It's called cephalocaudal progression. Causes of this, like I talked about, the red blood cells are breaking down because they, um, they their lifespan is shorter. Um, they might have, so they've got more, the red blood cells are being produced more, um, which is a, which is a big cause. Um, if a baby has any bruising from the delivery, whether it was a vacuum assist or a forceps assist, they might actually have bruising to their head. 
Uh, they might have a cephalohematoma, which when that breaks down, the red blood cells break down, uh, actually uh, can cause a higher levels of bile. Um, the decreased calories or amount of feedings initially, um, maybe their, their, their GI, their belly isn't working as hard as um, once they get going. Um, because they don't have that intake, uh, because either, you know, mom's only producing colostrum at this point, or they're eating very small amounts. Um, their liver might be immature um, due to birth trauma. They might experience cold stress, respiratory distress. If they're dehydrated, you're going to see, you might see jaundice, or if they're septic. So basically, anytime there's a... Uh, greater amount of red blood cells, anytime there's bruising, anytime there's a low intake of or amount volume of feeding. I hope that makes sense because I think I just rambled. <clears throat> so for physiological jaundice, some of our prophylactic measures so that our babies are not experiencing um, the risk um, keeping them, keeping their temperature above 97.8 um, because the actually cold stress can cause acidosis, which in turn causes higher risk for jaundice. Um, monitoring stool and making sure that they are stooling enough um, because once a the bilirubin is conjugated and excreted, it comes out in the stool. Um, so how do we get them to poop? We feed them. Uh, so make sure that we're feeding as soon as possible um, and in, in as much as possible um, so that uh, they're pooping and that they're starting to get their own bacteria to colonize in their belly. Um, some of the risk factors, which we kind of went over here in causes, um, but these actually increase the risk for jaundice. Um, like I said, and like I've stressed, if mom is breastfeeding only and she's not producing enough and baby's not got, doesn't have a good intake, um, if there's a family history of jaundice, anytime there's bruising, uh, anytime there's an assisted delivery, whether it's forceps or vacuum assisted, uh, anytime they have a cephalohematoma, which is that bruising on their head, Asian Ethnicity has a higher risk for jaundice. If mom is older than 25, uh, the baby is a male, and the younger of the gestational age. So how do we check um, for jaundice? You can press on the skin on the bridge of the nose uh, just to see, when you press down and when you let go, generally it's going to be like a lighter, a white. If they have jaundice, you're really going to see the yellow. Uh, as it progresses, you may see the yellow just in their scleras, and their eye, whites of their eyes. Um, we always want to make sure that we're keeping baby warm. Like I said, 97.8 or 36.5 Celsius, uh, making sure that they're staying above that level. Uh, as a nurse, we want to make sure that they are stooling enough, uh, and note the characteristics. Um, really encourage early feedings, uh, making sure they're having enough intake. Uh, if they're bottle fed, we can monitor exactly how much they're taking in. But if they're breastfed, you listen to the baby and make sure they're swallowing. That's kind of how you tell that they're getting enough in. Uh, they might order bilirubin levels to be drawn and if their billy levels are high, they'll do phototherapy. They used to send babies home with billy blankets, um, but that's not a common practice anymore. So if the baby's le billy levels are high, they're actually admitted to the hospital, whether it's peds or postpartum. Um, so that way the phototherapy can be initiated in the hospital with the nurse watching. Breastfeeding jaundice, 
Uh, we're going to see this if Billy, Ruby, Billy levels are greater than 12. Uh, this isn't the one um, that is specifically caused by either dehydration or babies not getting enough fluid intake. Um, there, sorry, typo. Um, this is not caused by any abnormalities in the milk. It's just they're not getting enough intake. Um, so prevention or treatment, um, frequent feedings, um, really kind of stress, uh, no supplementation with formula um, because if you supplement, mom will not produce as much milk. Um, and then um, getting a lactation cons consult for mom, helping her. Uh, what can she do to increase her her milk production or what can she do to have a better let down reflex or what can we do to get her milk to come in sooner. Uh, so that was breastfeeding jaundice. There's also breast milk jaundice. This is just related to the composition of mom's milk. Uh, if there is a, an increased amount of fatty acids um, in mom's milk, Billy's going to actually compete uh, for the binding sites on the albumin uh, and, not, and the bilirubin isn't going to be able to conjugate as easily. All right, so breastfed babies diet high in fats, low in carbs, um, because mom's milk is rich in fat and low in lactose, actually. When baby is in mom's belly, their intestinal tract is actually sterile. Once they are born and start eating, it is no longer sterile. If you remember from, oh, I don't know what class it's taught in, but the stomach is not a sterile place, so... That's why things like NG tubes and stuff, once they're in, they're not really kept sterile. Kept clean, but not sterile. Um, babies aren't allowed or aren't able to produce much saliva until they're about three months old. Uh, their salivary glands aren't mature yet. A newborn stomach can hold up to 50 to 60 mLs. That's what's in the book. I was always taught that a brand new baby, their stomach, uh, is only about the size of your pinky to your from the tip of your finger to the first knuckle. Uh, so it's very, very small. So within a few days, it does grow once they start get taking in more. Uh, but it's a very, very small amount. Uh, the cardiac sphincter, the stomach, um, is not mature when they're born. So you may see uh, them regurgitating some of their milk, whether they're breastfed or whether they're formula fed. They just, it's just not mature enough yet. And like I told you when we were talking about the vitamin K, the normal intestinal flora is not produced until they're nine months old. Uh, because when they're in, when they're a fetus, when they're in the mom's belly, uh, their intestinal tract, their stomach, all of that, their GI tract is sterile and it doesn't have the, the common bugs, the, the, the good bugs that they will have once they're nine months old. <coughs> Elimination. So the first stool that babies have is called meconium. It is, I just want to make sure I'm catching everything here. Um, it's black, it's green, it's tarry, it's thick. Uh, generally, babies should pass this within the first 24 hours and by definitely by 48 um, this is just all the crud that's formed uh, in, while they're in mom's belly. It's amniotic fluid. It's intestinal secretion. It's just mucosal cells. It's very, very thick. As you can see, it's the uh, part, the dark picture on the left. Uh, I used to work with a Filipino lady who I swore she could work black magic with these babies. If if baby's meconium was extra thick and they were having troubles pooping, we would give the babies to Fanny and just give her 20 minutes. She'd sit in the nursery with them and 
she would literally bend their knees up and kind of hang their, their little bottoms uh, and just kind of let them hang. I mean, she'd hold on to them. It's kind of hard to explain with I, when I can't, when you can't see me. Um, but she would hold these babies and if they hadn't pooped in 24 hours, Fanny would get them to poop in 20 minutes. I don't know what black magic she worked, but it was the most surreal thing I've ever seen. It was crazy. She could do it with any baby. She also used to cure their hiccups by pressing on, um, by putting her thumb between their eyes. And I could never get it to work, but she got it to work every single time. Um, so if your baby has not pooped uh, within 24 hours, do what you can to really, really try and get them to go. Uh, because then you worry about an, a blockage or um, if it's too thick, they're unable to pass or maybe their anus isn't patent. Um, but anyways, breastfed babies, their stool is the yellowed, yellow. It looks kind of like a mustard seed. It's kind of a loose consistency. Uh, when babies are formula fed, it's kind of like peanut butter um, in the first few days. Uh, it's pasty. Um, yeah, it's kind of looks like regular poop, I guess. Um, their kidneys are actually fully developed and actually working uh, at like 34 to 36 weeks gestation. Their GFR actually does pretty well at 30 to 40 by two weeks old. They can dilute their urine, but they can't concentrate their urine until they're about three months old. So. Oh, babies should always void within 24 hours of birth. Uh, a lot of times these babies might might void when they're born, when they're squished, but with all the amniotic fluid and every other fluid that's going on during birth, it may be missed. So always making sure that that baby has voided within the first 24 hours. If they have not voided, we need to assess them if they've had enough intake. Uh, or maybe their bladder's distended. Um, if they're restless or appear like they're in pain, that might be that they're unable to pee. Their bladder is filling up, but maybe they they don't have a, a if they're not patent, or um, maybe there's you know vernix or uh, just kind of a plug, so they're not able to urinate. Um, the first day, um, they may void two to six times, uh, but once once, at once these first couple days are, are, are over and they're actually getting a good intake, they could, they could urinate up to 25 times in 24 hours. Uh, so they may, may, they may go quite a bit once they actually start eating. Their bladder ranges anywhere from 6 mLs to 45 mLs, so they can hold about an ounce and a half. And generally their urine is the color of straw and it's odorless. Again, make sure our babies are voiding within 24 hours because they can have a lot of issues if they're not voiding. Brick dust spots. Uh, sometimes their urine might be kind of cloudy uh, because they've got extra mucus. Uh, their specific gravity is high, so it kind of looks like a pink stain. Um, these are called the brick dust spots. This is normal, um, but just make sure that we are, are educating our parents. They might also have, um, baby girls might actually have what's called pseudo-menstruation. Once mom's hormones are withdrawing, uh, they might actually have blood found in the diaper. It's kind of exactly what it looks like is that the newborn baby has had their period. Uh, but it's just because the maternal hormones are, are no longer present for these babies. All right. Immunology. You guys remember active acquired immunity, the babies forming their own antibodies because they're sick or from immunizations. Passive acquired immunity, IgG is transferred from mom to baby while they're in utero, especially during the third trimester, uh, because baby's not able to pr produce their own antibodies. They haven't been exposed to anything and they haven't gotten any vaccinations. So these IgG antibodies are actually 
help the baby in fighting any bacterial infection. <coughs> Colostrum. Before the mom's mature milk comes in for the first couple of days, they'll be giving, they'll be feeding the baby colostrum. And this is really high in the IgA uh, and also gives some passive immunity to the newborn. So this kind of protects the GI and the respiratory tract. Immunization should start about two months old uh, so that the baby can actually start getting their own active acquired immunity. And then they start producing their own IgA at four to six months. Neurological adaptations. The newborn baby, it, their brain is about the quarter of the size of an adult brain. And the nerve fibers, they're not all myelinated uh, at birth. So this is why they have the poor control of their muscular, muscle, muscles. <laughs> it's like two in the morning. I'm sorry, guys. This is why they have poor control of their muscles. Um, they're startled easy and they have the tremors uh, because all of their nerve fibers are not completely myelinated. So these I want you to look at. These are the neural reflexes. The moral, basically if you're walking by the crib and you bump it and they stretch out their arms, they start crying, their legs might, and then they'll retract them. It's also called the startle reflex, so if that helps you remember it, the moral or the startle reflex, they're going to like jump and their arms are going to go out and they're going to start crying. Uh, but watch these videos that I have. They're very good at helping explain it. Uh, grasping, so when you put an object in the baby's hand um, or stroke their palm, they'll actually hold on um, to whatever, if it's your finger or if it's a pencil or whatever, they can actually hold on tight enough that you can lift them up. Um, the Babinski reflex, the outer part of their foot on their sole is stroked and their toes will span out. Uh, rooting, if you uh, kind of touch the side of their face, their cheek, uh, they will actually turn their face towards whatever the stimulus is and start making sucking motions. The sucking reflex, Whenever the roof of the baby's mouth is touched, the baby will start sucking. Um, so these are just signs that their neurological uh, system is intact. And like I said, watch these videos. They are some good videos and really explain and really show what the, the reflexes are. <coughs> so newborn babies... They actually have a self-quieting ability. They can start using their own resources to soothe, them, soothe themselves. Uh, it might be just that they find their hand and they start sucking on it, and that soothes them. Um, they also have what's called habituation. Um, there is a video here, but basically what it is, it's a protective mech that they, if there's um, stimulations that are complex and repetitive and you know they just need to it's just too much for them to handle um, so maybe a, when a light is shining in a newborn's eyes uh, or maybe somebody's snapping in their face they're gonna initially react to it like the light their their pupils are constrict and they might blink and they might close their eyes um, or when somebody's snapping they might turn and look but it, once these stimulus are continued, their responses are going to decrease. Uh, so it's basically they're kind of, they get used to the stimulus and they can ignore it or uh, kind of not even be bothered by it. I sure wish I <laughs> had this into, you know, parenthood. Mom, 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 mom. No, I'm just kidding, guys. Um, but it's it's really kind of a, a really neat thing to to see that these babies have that much, um, that they're able to do that. It's really kind of cool. Um, <coughs> uh, they can actually, orientation, they're able to be alert and they're able to follow and fixate on any like visual stimuli that they find appealing. They can't see very far. Uh, so if it's like really into their face and it's close to them, 
they can actually follow and fixate on that. Um, the cuddliness, babies that are cuddled or cuddle more, they're easier to console and their temperament is more even. They're not up, up and down and all over the place. All right, so periods of reactivity. So the first period of reactivity, that is about birth to you know, 30 minutes or so. They're awake, they're active. Their sucking reflex is very strong during this time. So put those two together, they're awake and active and they have a very strong sucking reflex. This is the best time to start breastfeeding uh, because they're going to really be awake and they're not going to fall asleep and they're going to last for a while while they're nursing. Um, they're also going to have, their respirations are going to be increased and so is their heart rate. This goes into uh, the period of inactivity to sleep phase. After 30 minutes, well it's not set in stone, but about 30 minutes after birth, their respirations are going to start to slow, their heart rate is going to start to slow, not bradycardiac or anything, um, but just going to be slower than what it was during the first period of reactivity. And this period might last a few minutes to four hours. It just kind of depends on the baby. And during this time, they are out. They are hard to wake up. So you want to make sure that you're trying to get that breast, that first time breastfeeding in before this period actually hits because once this time hits they're going to be out they're going to sleep hard <clears throat> so then the second period of reactivity uh, will last a little bit long will last a lot longer after they had their power nap i guess you could call their the second phase the second period of reactivity might last four hours again their heart rate and their respiratory rate um, is actually going to increase and they're going to actually start uh, producing more mucus. So, Behavioral states of the newborn, there's going to be sleep states and there's going to be alert states and it's just going to kind of depend on the baby. Uh, they're deep or quiet sleep um, or they're going to have an active and a light sleep, basically the REM sleep the REM sleep, or their alert states are, they're going to be awake, but they're going to be drowsy, or they're going to be quiet and alert, they're going to be active alert, or they might be crying. Um, newborns actually have sensory abilities. Uh, like I said before, they're able to notice, follow, fixate on stimuli. Uh, they're able to hear sounds. Uh, they can recognize mom by their smell when they're born. Um, babies, newborns can actually differentiate between the sweet and sour taste if uh, mom has had something that uh, makes her breast milk seem more sweet. They can tell. Um, they really, they're able to have, they have tactile um, ability. They are sensitive to being touched and held and cuddled. And most babies do respond well to being swaddled and being wrapped up tight. So their response to the stimuli actually depend on a lot of different things. Are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they, um, is their temperament? Are they, you know, a, a, an upset baby or are they chill baby? Are they crying? Are they irritable? And at what level or what state of consciousness are they? Are they sleeping? Are they um, in their sleep state, uh, yeah, it just kind of depends on what their, uh, what's going on with them, how they're going to respond to the environmental stimuli. And that is it. We made it through the very first part. Um, if you guys have any questions with that, I know it gets kind of long and kind of drawn out. It's kind of, I wish I could be up in front of you guys talking and showing you guys stuff as I'm doing it. But um, if you guys have any questions, let me know and I will get back to you. All right. Thanks, guys.